Hello and welcome to Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast, where I'll be hanging out with players and teachers and having conversations loosely based around harmonica. This week's guest is a versatile player on the diatonic and chromatic, and is comfortable playing many different musical genres, including, but not limited to, Irish folk, jazz, pop, and blues. He's recorded and toured with huge names ranging from Sting to Van Morrison, and, as well as being an inspirational player, he's also a hugely creative harmonica customizer. He is Brendan Power. Welcome to the podcast, Brendan. Glad to be here, Tomlin. How are you doing today? Yeah, pretty good. Um, it's um, still uh, still in sort of lockdown mode, but we've got a bit of a garden here, and the weather's great. And I'm getting out on my bike occasionally for a little ride in the countryside, so can't really complain. That's that's very cool. So, where, for people who don't know where where you are, where, where, whereabouts are you based? I'm in um, the southeast of um, England, in um, in Canterbury, um, which is um, for anyone who. Uh, I mean, funnily enough, I went to a place, I went to Canterbury University, and um, we've got all these names that are based around this area um, in New Zealand. Um, you know, like in, if you look at uh, many colonial countries, um, like New Zealand, um, America, America, Canada, or whatever, you find a lot of place names from um, the, the British Isles, from Scotland. Actually, there's a big, strong, there's a strong um, Scottish area in New Zealand, which is down in the south of the South Island. Uh, Dunedin, the main city there, apparently that's the you know correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure that's the is it the gallic name for edinburgh it is indeed um, yeah yeah so dunedin is the main area there and um there's a lot of uh, very heavy scottish uh, in, in influence down there and um so where where i where i went to university i was um, grew up in um, the nelson at the top of the south island but i went to university in uh, canterbury university um and there's all these place names from where i ended up now you know christchurch um is the main city there and there's Christchurch is everywhere here. So yeah, it's it's the long answer to a, um, a rambling answer to your question. But basically, I'm in in Canterbury in uh, the UK. Um, yeah, which is a a very lovely part of the country, very picturesque. And uh, you said you were getting out on your bike. Uh, I've I've been watching some of your uh, biking and harmonica videos, uh, which have been fun. It's uh, I think that there are worse places to to be stuck at the moment. Yes, there are. Yeah, I mean, very lucky. I mean, it's quite a small city. Um, have you been here at all? Or? I have, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, it's pretty small, mm -hmm. um, and the, um, the the countryside and the woodlands are quite, um, you know, very close to the city city um, outskirts. So it only takes a few minutes on your bike to to get out into, um, you know, farmland or woodland. I think it might be down to um, things like the old the kings, like Henry VIII and all that sort of, um, in, uh, you know. Um, ensured that um, there were hunting areas all around the country that they could go to and with their mates and uh, you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> be deer and uh, grouse and everything for there for them to shoot and kill and whatever and in this area i think that's the reason one of the reasons that there's still a lot of woodland around here so you know it's a, it's a sort of a strange reason and also of course there was a lot of um uh, stuff done in the woodlands up till the um, beginning of the well, even into the 20th century, you know, like coppicing and all that kind of thing. Mm. You get a lot of that here, you know, like this chestnut. And um, if you go into the woodland, you can see um, evidence of um, a lot of um, coppicing. And um, they used to make charcoal. And, and there were these interesting characters called bodgers. Have you heard of you know, I've about bodgers? What, what's a bodger? Well, it's funny. It's, it's <laughs> in, in New Zealand, where, where I grew up, uh, quite a few words um, have come from, um, you know, came with the early settlers. And they stayed there. In New Zealand, but they've died out, you know, in the in the mother country, if you like. A paddock is one. For instance, um, in New Zealand, every farm, every farm field is a paddock. We call everything a paddock. Here, it's very, um, it's very limited, isn't it? I mean, I think in Formula One, you get the the paddock, and there's maybe some limited uses. Well, bodge, bodge is another one. A bodge job. Um, we we. Um, it's kind of like a rough and ready job. It does mm -hmm. the trick, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look very good. Steampunk might be the modern equivalent of bod a bodge job. But anyway, the bodgers were um, these characters who um, lived in the woods and, and um, often made a living from, um, um, you know, sort of um, uh, making charcoal and also making furniture with those uh, very primitive lathes, you know, where you've got a, a sapling from a tree um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's pulled down uh, with a string um, to the ground. And then they put a spindle, a little lay, um, piece of wood in it, you know, from the forest. And it, they, um, with a foot action, they, they bend the sapling up and down. It twists the piece of wood. And then they sort of, um, you know, uh, it's like a very primitive lathe, really. So anyway, they were the bodgers. And there's a lot of evidence of bodging, bodging uh, 
around this area. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. I, I, I like the idea of, of people coming here for, for a harmonica podcast and learning about <laughs> bodges. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of exactly what I wanted from uh, from chatting to, to various people. Because I, I don't know about you, but uh, I always find it quite, quite fun when I go to uh, kind of harmonica events uh, which I'm I'm really missing at the moment. But um, when when people talk to you and and they're surprised that you have other interests uh, outside mm. of harmonica, I'm like, but but you're a harmonica person and you're supposed to just live and breathe harmonica. It's like, well, yeah, but <laughs> other stuff too. What about yourself? I mean, if you don't mind, um, yeah. What what are your other, you know, what other interests are you are you got? I mean, you must be very busy with your school because I know you've got a heaps of students you're putting out videos very you know on a regular basis yeah, yeah. so the, there's there's quite a lot of work with with uh running the school um but I, i'm really fortunate that i have a couple of people helping me with that uh including my wife uh so it means that i, I do have time to to do other things um mm. I, I, like what, you what sort, of stuff do they, what sort of stuff do they do um so i i have a i have a video editor um who who well, he also does the podcast edits as well, so that uh, that makes that's life. A huge thing. Oh, oh my god! But, you know, that's because <laughs> you spend so much time on video editing, but it means you must tr- you must trust them pretty well because I've tried that as well. But then when they when someone who you know is a good you know editor does the edit, I, I'm always a little bit um, oh god, why did he choose that take instead of that one? You know that kind of thing. And in the end, um, I ended up. I ended up doing them myself, but it, it is a huge drain on your time, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a huge drain, uh, but you're absolutely right. There's there's that there's an adjustment period where you have to accept that it's going to take even longer because you're you're kind of training someone up in in what you want. Yeah. Um, but but it's totally worthwhile because I mean I, I I used to really enjoy video editing, but. I realized that it was taking me away from practicing and putting together tuition material and all, all the things that kind of only I can do. Uh, mm. Rather, you know, video editing isn't something that makes me a better harmonica player or teacher. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I, I love I love Fergus so much. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, no, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good good thing to to do. And as I say, I've tried it, but I maybe I'm more of a I don't know. I don't know. More, f- yeah. Uh, in the end, I I end up doing it myself because I I think, uh, why, you know, I'm sort of always a bit dubious about whether I would have done a better job with that particular bit. But yeah, it's a it's a maybe it's just one of those things where you just got to accept that things accept how things come out and then um, think well, you know, okay, um, maybe I could have done a, a slightly different job myself, but it, I'm saving hours and hours and hours of work. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, mm. you, you've got to accept that it might not be kind of exactly what you wanted, mm. but if you can get it eighty to ninety percent of the way there, then that's that's pretty good. Mm. Um, so yeah, so so I, I've got got Fergus, and then I've got uh, Leanne who um, does a lot of the kind of administrative stuff that's really boring but really essential to making sure that you know students can get into access material and things and. Mm kind of help with with any issues on boring mm. things like billing and and stuff like that so mm. so she's great and then yeah joe my wife will will help with uh kind of day-to-day like practicalities of filming and uh mm. wh- when we have workshops and things she's she's the person mm. running around making sure that everything's working as mm. it should great um, great so yeah it's so this, this is your main family family income then it is your, your, yeah 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 Mm, great well done congratulations <laughs> thank you thank you but i do i do do other stuff and like you i love cycling um mm. and uh, i've been doing a lot more of it since lockdown because um, mm. i don't i don't know what it's like where you are but um cycling in edinburgh is a little bit terrifying at the best of times because you've got buses and trams and lots of traffic and a very small city uh, mm. but since since corona there are far fewer vehicles on the road, so it's actually really pleasant to cycle around mm. the city. Mm. Where are you from originally? Because um, you're <laughs> not from Edinburgh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, well, so I, I'm I'm kind of from from all over. So I was born in Kent, uh, so oh, not, right. not not too far from where you are, um, mm. and then moved to Argentina, um, and then moved back to England, and then 
went to France for most the biggest chunk of my schooling and then moved up to Edinburgh. Mm. What took you up to Edinburgh in the end? Uh, so I came here to study uh mm. to, to study a very non-music related subject which was psychology and mm. uh stayed um because you know a- age-old story boy meets girl mm. and uh she wanted to you know she wanted to stay in scotland and i'm very happy with that decision so good so, yeah, yeah no, it's a great city, Edinburgh. I, i've lived there as well um like in, when i was in the river dance show um we uh, were in edinburgh for about six months i think it was our first extended run away from london and uh yeah it was great Really good, and also I've um, you know played there over the years, you know, and um, um, and um, just the odd gig and here and there, and made quite a few you know a few good friends there. So yeah, it's a great place, great city. Yeah, um, I was I, I was actually kind of intrigued because um, I, I was going through your your bio and um, you you kind of have have the the similar setup of uh, quite quite a lot of movement from from different countries and uh, you know you were born in Kenya grew up in New Zealand and but you've been in the UK since the early 90s yes about 92 I think yeah uh, and so why 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 did you come to the UK <laughs> same reason <laughs> I met, a, I met a, an English woman funnily enough um uh she um she proposed to me after about five minutes of talking wow um and uh, so yeah, it's a bit of a long story there but <laughs> it was um yeah, we ended up um, uh, getting married in New Zealand. Uh, it was a bit of a green card, you know, thing for her. She she'd been there for a wee while and needed someone to marry fast in order to stay. Um, but we we became, you know, we it really worked out um, really well, um, you know. In other, in, and we were together about sixteen years, not together now, but uh, so that's a fairly fairly good whack. But anyway, yeah, she'd been travelling around the world for many years, you know, Southeast Asia. Australia, New Zealand, and um, she was kind of like hankering a bit to get back um, to the British Isles, and I was um, I was just ready to get out, see the world at that point. So it worked out quite well. So, but yeah, the same reason as you, a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's it's a, it's pretty much the best reason to to do most things. So it's it's a classic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's uh, let's kind of get a little bit of the the origin story of uh, you playing music because um, I think a lot of people picture really really accomplished musicians as kind of starting you know when they're barely able to walk and uh, being sort of child prodigies and uh, I I, I'm, I don't think that you were a late starter but uh, you, you you're not. You don't fall into that category. So what uh, what triggered it all? Yeah, no, I only um, picked up the harp when I was 20, 20 years old, and I had no musical background at all. So um, uh, it was just really, um, you know, the classic going to, uh, I went to, someone dragged me along to a Sonny Terry concert, Sonny Terry and Brandon <laughs> McGee. In, um, so I'm pretty old now. I was born in 56, 1956, and I went to see them in 1976. So I was 20. I think it was when I, I was a university in Canterbury University. And, um, they have this thing called orientation, which I think they have in most universities, where you have at the beginning of the year, um, they have all these free events and um, students can go to. And um, one of them was this concert. So there were two totally unknown you know, musicians. And I just went along because it was free, basically, with a friend. And was just utterly blown away by the, um, you know, the sound of Sonny's harp. Um, and um, I mean, uh, I, I, I sort of told this story a few times, but um, I believe by that stage they just hated each other, you know, with a passion. Sonny Terry and Bernie McGee. <laughs> I mean, they yeah. had to stay together because it was their brand, you know, it's like salt and pepper or gin and tonic. Sonny Terry yeah. and Bernie McGee. Um, but they just, um, you could tell. I mean, they were just a, we were on a very wide stage, you know, one at each end, and they didn't talk to each other, but they sort of made the odd sort of snide comment about each other to the audience. And then um, Brownie would play tricks on Sonny. You know, he'd um, start a song in, you know, uh, in a key that wasn't the usual one. Sonny would hunt around in his, in his uh, waist pack for, to find the right harp. As soon as he got it, <laughs> Brownie would change key again. So all that kind of thing went on. But, um, you know, there were, that was only a small part of it. Um, you know, when they, when they were playing together, they were just, they had a great, incredible sound. And Sonny's harp playing just blew me away. So, you know, I went out and bought a harp the next day and um, uh, got started. But, um, yeah, uh, someone, um, uh, when I went to the, the record shop, um, they said, um, you know, I said, like some, you know, harmonica music. And um, so they, they sold me a Bob Dylan record, um, <laughs> which was uh, a <laughs> great record. Um, but the harmonica playing wasn't what I was after 
what I was after. So I went back again and said, um, you got some other stuff. And I got um, that, um, a Sonny Boy, Sonny Boy Williamson double album, you know, Sonny, uh, Rice Miller. Mm-hmm. This is my story. So that became my kind of like my Bible, I guess, or my, my um, you know, I just listened to it incessantly and tried to figure out what was going on. So, you know, you, you 1976, there's, there's no YouTube. It's probably quite difficult. I'm assuming it's quite difficult to find a harmonica teacher. Uh, did you just kind of sit and work things out by ear? Was that the... Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely nothing around. Um, and um, being in New Zealand, you know, you're even further away from whatever sources of um, information there were. So, yeah, it was really on my own. And I started out playing the, the tongue roll method because, I, you know, I could find out I could get a, a single note easier that way, you know, just with this. So I started out for a whole year, I think I played the, <laughs> the roll <laughs> tongue. But then after a period of time, I thought, you know, I just couldn't, um, get you know all the effects that these guys were getting, and I thought I must be doing something wrong. So then I experimented, and eventually ended up um, with the um, sort of you know lip pursing mm-hmm. method, which seemed to um, do the job. So yeah, that was an example of you know within five minutes on YouTube, you could find out. <laughs> I could have saved myself a year right there. So um, you know that was the way it was then, but yeah. um, you had to just um, work out things out on your own. Yeah, it's it's funny the uh, the, the tongue roll uh, embouchure. I, I I've had quite a few students kind of come and sign up, and they kind of look at the first few lessons and be like, yeah, I've, I've been playing for a couple of years and I've I've always singled out notes by rolling my tongue. Is that going to be a problem? And mm. it's like, well, so far I'm yet to find someone who can do uh, bending convincingly. Um, I, I might be wrong. Have you have you come across people who can do other stuff with the tongue roll? I'll just experiment, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not really it's not really a goer, is it? No. <laughs> there are some good chromatic players who use it. Um, I'm just trying to think. I think my friend Jakob Vent might be might use that method. Um, he's a Danish um, chromatic player. I think he might, but and I, I think there are one or two chromatic players who use it but yeah on diatonic it's not um, it's not going to work is it mm-hmm. you need to um be able to shape your jaw and and also get the tongue slap effects and all that kind of thing so 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 do you do the the kind of tongue blocked effects as well as as lip purse stuff not really i mean i do a few octaves you know but i don't really do the um slapping tongue um kind of thing i sort of looked into it once or twice you know over the years and could never really um i, I I mean, it's like you're going back to being a beginner status in some ways, and certainly in terms of getting single notes and clear, clean lines. So, um, yeah, I just um, it just didn't suit me. I, I just didn't find it. Um, I mean, I do appreciate um, good um, tongue block playing, you know, in other people, but um, it, it, it never worked for me, and I'm happy enough um, with, um, you know, the lip pursing method. Yeah, it's, it's such a, a difficult decision to make uh especially kind of the, the further down the road you go um mm-hmm. i mean I, I i did a workshop with david barrett a couple of years ago and that was the first time that i'd really gotten super excited about tongue blocking and mm. and since then I've, I've been kind of working on adding tongue blocking quite quite uh, uh in, in quite a disciplined way um mm. but it, it's it's so frustrating knowing all the things that that would be quite easy to throw in uh, lip pursed, uh, you know, throwing in overblows and, and things in the middle octave that mm. um, I, I just, so my, my big win from lockdown has been uh, tongue blocking and overblowing the six hole. Um, and and it's it's horrible and squeaky and disgusting, but I, I think it's going to get cleaner and nicer. Um, but I'm, I'm still not sure if I, if I really want to dedicate that amount of time to... Um, I don't know. It might end up being a, a hybrid player. It's uh, it's it's a difficult mm. decision. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I th- there are. I mean, I think. Um, uh, I mean, many um, modern players, um, you know, do swap between them. I mean, people like uh, Howard Levy. I think Jason Ritchie does as well. Swaps mm. between the two. So, yeah, I think it's um, you know theoretically a good thing to be able to do both. Yeah. But then again, a lot of people just are happy with one or the other, and um, you know. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. Um, yeah, my impression was that some uh, dexterity and speed and um, might be compromised using tongue blocking, but I could be wrong. I mean, I, I think quite a few chromatic um, classical chromatic players use it, and they they play fast and clean. So, um, yeah, I think I think the thing 
is, is that there, there's lots of received wisdom on on both both sides of you know tongue blocking mm. and lip pursing, and bit mm. by bit with the internet, we're we're coming across more and more people who uh, completely throw that out of the window, and and you know there is that thing of oh well tongue blocking you can't get the articulation and the speed, but then someone pops up who's like oh well I can, and and so mm. we have to rethink everything. Um, so, which is uh, it's kind of kind of fun and uh, and exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you can you can kind of um, uh, relate it to guitar in a way. I mean, some people just play with a pick, which is mm -hmm. almost like the equivalent of um, um, lip pursing. Other people use um, you know various finger style kind of things, which you could say is the equivalent of tongue blocking. And um, some guitarists use both. Some you know basically just do one or the other. So you know um, it's um, it's a similar thing to that. And you can't say. You know, there's great players in, on each particular style, and there's some great players who do both. So, you know. Yeah, the guitar is a great, great example because I feel that harmonica players are sometimes a little bit more um, certain about what's right whether it's lip pursing or tongue blocking and, and guitarists, because I, I play guitar as well. And um, I, I feel like I've never had a uh, plectrum user kind of come up to me and say, you shouldn't be finger picking. That's wrong. They, quite often they, they're like, wow, that's really cool. I like that you're doing that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's accepted as an alternative. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, if I get the feeling there's more, there's more of a kind of like a, um, I don't know. Uh, what's the word? Um, uh, moral high ground um, disapproval vibe coming from the tongue blockers than the lip purses. I think it's the tongue blockers think, you know, they, um, you know, they're the ones who do it the right way and everyone else does it, you know, who doesn't, does it wrong. And, um, you know, I don't know if the lip purses um, have the same kind of, um, uh, there's quite the same kind of like feeling of brotherhood or sort of, um, no. <laughs> you know, we're all in this together and we're against those tongue blockers. Yeah, so I think the tongue blockers, um, you know, it's the traditional way and um, it's the way, um, you know, uh, well, a little Walter did it or whatever. So I think there is more of it, more of that kind of thing coming from those guys, but whatever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I really, I don't care. I find it interesting. And, and I think if you, if you understand why you would do one or the other, that that's the mm. main thing. They're both valid. They're both useful. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. I mean, there are there are these things about tone, you know, uh, tongue blockers saying, well, you, you can't get a good tone, you know, um, unless you do tongue blocking. But I don't really agree with that. I think a lot of it's how you shape your mouth, and um, hmm. you know, you can you can get a you know a nice tone with um, lip pursing as well. It's how you you know shape your mouth. I mean, if you've got a a harp and you play, you know, that sort of thin. If you play with a thin, small mouth, but if you open up your mouth. You can, you know, you can make a bigger sound. So it's a, you know, I think you can, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that tone thing really holds up. But yeah. certainly there's some effect you can get with tongue blocking that you definitely can't with lip pursing. Granted, all the um, nice little cording, you know, cord, ghost cording and slap tongue rhythm and stuff. That's, that's, and that's a beautiful thing that I love to hear with good tongue blockers. Definitely. No, I, I totally agree on, on that. Um, I, I'm really intrigued because you had this, uh, this really important formative experience going to see some band that you didn't know, who turns out to be Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, which is amazing in itself. What, what were you planning on doing? Like, what, what, what was your game plan for life before music? <laughs> uh, well, um, before music, um, I suppose one of the main things I was into was um, outdoors. You know, in New Zealand, we call it tramping. Um, uh, here you'd call it hiking, I guess, but like fairly hardcore, like going out for a week or more and um, quite high, you know, like everything in New Zealand is quite a bit higher. So you'd be up at five, six thousand feet for a week or so, um, just um, doing quite hard walks every day. Um, and um, so that was my I just loved that. And that, that was uh, that was, you know, something I was really into. Um, canoeing uh, you know whitewater canoeing <laughs> so i was more into those kind of things um and um then yeah it's got this music bug and i was just totally um i was in my bedroom for eight hours a day <laughs> um, but um yeah i was actually studying um an arts degree i did a um a ba in english and religious studies um and religious studies wasn't what it wasn't theology where you're studying to be a you know a priest or something it was like studying religions as if they're rocks you know mm -hmm. you know 
okay, here's Hinduism, what is that thing? Okay, there's Buddhism. You know, basically studying them dispassionately. And in some ways that was therapy for me because I was brought up as, um, you know, in a fairly strict Catholic family. So I thought, well, here's my chance. I'll see what the other, you know, what the other ones are like or what the other ones say. And at, at the end of it, it just totally cured me of all religion. I became a, well, atheist agnostic at the end of it. So I'm, I'm glad I did it because it um, helped me kind of, um, you know, uh, they're all the same, as far as I can see, all these religions and ideologies. It's not just religions, but also ideologies like, um, you know, various political ideologies are in the same boat. They like to claim they have the ultimate truth and then lay it down for everybody else, which I just um, i have got a, a strong antipathy towards now. But anyway, so that was what I was doing. And I did an MA in religious studies. But by that stage, I was interested in um, Taoism, you know, the Chinese um, yin yang kind mm -hmm. of thing. But again, it was just really... Um, out of interest, and by then um, a guy called Chuang Tzu, a, a Chinese, um, really interesting Chinese um, philosopher in that school. They were so advanced, those guys, um, you know, like 2000 BC, and they were talking about relativity, you know, you know, what's really good, what's really big, what's really small, you know, how do we know, how do we judge all these things? Quite advanced thinking. So anyway, um, that's what I was doing at university, but back home, I was back in, I was really studying Sonny Boy Williamson. <laughs> so at the end of it, I mean, I had a degree, a master's degree, but I've never actually used it. Um, I just went straight into, onto the dole and doing part-time jobs, <laughs> playing the harmonica. That, I, that, I was, I was intrigued by kind of what happened before you started uh, you know, finishing university and then before you started doing sessions and starting doing mm. things like river dance, like what what was? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I guess I left university. Um, um, I think I started, went to university about seventy four, and I left there about eighty. And um, by that stage, I've been playing for about four years, I guess. And um, I was starting to get a little bit of a, a name. Um, and I heard that, you know, basically Auckland was the place to go because that's the big city. It's like the London of New Zealand. Um, that's the place you want to go if you wanted to, you know, do anything and, you know, get any decent work or whatever. So, yeah, I ended up in Auckland. Um, just I knew one person there was crashing on their floor. And then um, so I started to get a few sessions in, in New Zealand, you know, like um, TV jingles and playing on the odd record. But I was it was very much hand to mouth all through the 80s, really. I was doing part time jobs. And yeah, on the dole, dole occasionally. So I was just basically playing in a several little groups, folk groups, country groups, blues groups, and um, just, I suppose, learning about music and getting to know people. But it was, yeah, pretty much a, a hand to mouth existence. Um, at the end of the 80s, um, I had scraped enough money together to do an album. So I, I um, did my first album. Um, and um, well, actually, I did, I did one. It's a strange one in the mid 80s which is called country harmonica which is all was it was along to some these nashville backing tracks that some people had brought back from nashville which had vocal harmonies on them uh -huh. and um they um thought well this would be a good way to they like my playing maybe make a harmonica record so <laughs> i made this harmonica record with all these vocal harmonies coming in every so often it's very cheap and nasty but it's some good you know some good playing on there i think but that was um that was something that they paid for uh, towards the end at the end of the 90s i um well with a bit of help from my dad as well i made my my own record um state of the heart let's get rid of this wasp there you go mate and um yeah then that led to um a record guy another record guy there um i sent it to a few labels there um one of them um took it overseas to you know these kind of like um record company meetings that trade fairs that they have and they played it to people and they said, yeah, he's, he's pretty good, but you should get him to play some, you know, easy listening, well-known tunes. <laughs> so basically he said, well, OK, well, I'll put out another album of your stuff if, you, if you'll if you do me an album of easy listening uh, music, you know, like What a Wonderful World and Theme from the Deer Hunter and all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I said, OK. So um, basically I did, I did that and uh, that album has probably sold way more than any of my other albums, even though it's not one that I, um, you know, go around showing everybody um but it, you know it's 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 pretty good and it's of the style but um that album sold pretty well um and um it was taken up by some dutch label and um yeah it sold many many uh copies I, unfortunately i haven't got paid for <laughs> as i should have from it but that's uh, that's something i found out later you know the the dodginess of the music industry which you you probably know about yeah. um but anyway yeah. um so that was uh that and then uh, then i came to britain and um 
I did this album called New Irish Harmonica, and that kind of led to a lot of things. Um, and so I was able to make a make a sort of a career here. Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose that's it in a, in a you know in a in a nutshell. Nice. But along the way, I've just got interested in so many different styles, you know, and um, so I've been able to support myself um, from the harmonica one way or the other, playing, or more recently um, from about 2000, um, doing so sort of custom work as well, and um, being able to just indulge my interests in different styles as they come along. Yeah, this is something I wanted to ask you about because you, you, you have mastered so many different styles of music and. Uh, Personally, I, I find it really well. I, I find it an ongoing task to master blues, uh, mm. and you know, you think we have three chords. I, I should have it by now, but it's still something that I'm working on. Uh, and well, it's like that. I mean, the blues is um, it's a deep, it's a deep ocean, and uh, you know, you can keep swimming in it for your whole life. So you know, don't don't feel <laughs> you will never get it. Any any musical style like that is like that. You never actually. When you say I've mastered styles, I haven't really. I've just dabbled in them and learned a few of the main um salient features um of them and um you know but you i'm only really uh, you know dabbled in them really put my toe in the water <laughs> so so how, how do you approach that when, when you because i've heard you describe yourself as a, as a musical magpie so when, when you see a, a shiny new genre what's the what's the approach to kind of get get in yeah the... i mean it has to give me a buzz or you know really get me get me intrigued um you know for for instance um chinese music was a was a fairly recent one and it was listening to um the the erhu which is this chinese um, stringed instrument and other similar instruments that have got this huge bending range and um and it, i mean what they do with it they just use pentatonic scales most of the time which is you know as you know a five note scale but what they do with those five notes is extraordinary in terms of expression and um so that was how are they doing that? I thought, and can I do that on the harmonica? So, um, you know, basically, I just listen really closely to the things that give me a buzz. You know, a particular piece of music, even if it's just a phrase or something like that, and try and work out what's exactly happening. I mean, sometimes what's really handy for that kind of thing is slow down software, um, which I've used <laughs> right back in New Zealand um, when I first got a Charlie McCoy record. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, there was no such thing as slow down software or computers or anything. So, I mean, I, I just slow down a 33 speed record down to 16 speed, um, you know, which halved the speed, but also took his, his harmonica down an octave. So it sounded more like a saxophone, but it's the same principle. Basically, um, you know, if you want to really understand um, something, the devil is in the detail with harmonicas as with many things. But um, certainly if you're start, trying to study a particular player, players characteristic you know the, the most essential parts of their style it's really good to slow down the um the music and i'm sure you do that in your teaching mm -hmm. but um, it's something that i've always done so slow it down you know even to 50 percent, even 25 percent, just to kind of really hear all the nitty-gritty of what's exactly going on and that can really help unlock um you know styles and um for instance in irish music um or Bulgarian music where they're using very fast little decorations on just about every note's got a, some kind of little twiddle or twirl you know they, they go by so fast um but when you get the you know the, using the slow down software you can hear them you know um and hear exactly what notes being played and how long for and blah 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 so so yeah certainly that's something that I've um um, I've done. I've sort of forgotten what the question was now. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, when, whenever I do get into these things, I really delve down into the nitty gritty and the detail of them to try and work out what's going on. And then I often find I can't do it on harmonicas I've got. Mm -hmm. So um, luckily, I've you know got the skills and the kind of I suppose the, the know how to work out if if that's going there, um, that note's going there, then and I can't do it on this harmonica, then I need to change those notes in order to get a sound like that. So that's what I that's what I do next is try and make a harmonica that can get the authentic characteristic elements, the main elements of the style that I'm interested in. That That's something that I, I definitely wanted to, to quiz you about because I, I, I started going through uh, all of the different tunings and uh, kind of harmonica uh, variations that you've come up with and there are just so many and and i can i, I kind of realized that that this this was sort of born out of a necessity when you're playing something and you're thinking 
that that note's missing where is it um mm. so what, what what was kind of the the first uh change that you made to a harmonica and and why you know what why why did you do it well i started out as a diatonic player and um i think it was uh, maybe after i heard charlie mccoy um, because um, I could hear that he was playing. By that stage, I'd figured out what second position was, and that took me a, bloody, <laughs> a couple of years probably. I had no idea. Uh, but anyway, I finally figured it out and um, had started to play along to some blues players. And then I heard Charlie McCoy, and he was playing in second position, but he was getting that major seventh sound in, in second position. I thought, what the hell is going on there? Cause, and it, I figured out he must have um, changed that five draw. He must have tuned it up. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So you can tune reeds. So I just, you know, I'd always tinkered with things. My dad was a real, um, uh, you know, he was a brilliant um, sort of uh, mechanic. Um, I mean, he was an entomologist by, but his passion was his workshop at home. So I'd been around um, tools and, you know, I'd always fixed up my bikes and stuff. So actually um, tinkering with a harmonica was, um, came naturally. It was very easy, you know, the very simple little elements. So I just figured out, all oh, right. So scraped away at that five draw. It went up. Ah, oh, that's what's going on. So basically, that then led to. Um, so I, I um, on that album, the country harmonica um, that I mentioned uh, early, the mid '80s. I mean, that's basically using a lot of those early ideas. Um, it's it's got a um, it's got a raised um, five draw, and um, but I also. By that stage, I was hacking harps and making what I call stretch harps. It wasn't a 10-hole harp. It was an 11-hole harp. I doubled. I figured out I didn't really like the reverse breathing pattern at the top end of Richter, so I chopped the reed plate at hole number six and moved it along one hole mm -hmm. and put in another little reed there, um, you know, chopped out another, sliced out another reed from another harmonica, put it in there at hole six. So hole six and hole seven would be, say, the same note. On a C harp, two G notes, if you like. So then suddenly I could bend that B in hole number seven draw. And then the top octave was sort of like the middle octave. But it meant that I had an extra <laughs> a hole that I would have had to chop off. You know, like if I, I'd i moved the, the, the draw replate. No. Yeah. Um, I'd moved the – let me just get this right. I'd moved the blow replate. Oh, God. Um, let me think of this. Yes, I'd moved the, I, I chopped up the blow replate, moved that along one hole. Uh-huh. Yes, and um, so um, I slotted a hole, a reed into hole seven where the blow seven had been, okay. and now I had a, a reed sticking out the top. Hole right. ten was just so I, I basically chopped up the comb and made a, an eleven-hole harp, and then um, yeah, so um, got another reed and put that in hole number ten on the draw reed side. So anyway, that was kind of um, an extrapolation from this um, initial learning about the um, Sunny Terry, uh, the Charlie McCoy. Um, you know, tuning up that five draw. And then that just basically led on to all sorts of um, experiments. But, uh, yeah, um, that was the first one, really, yeah. that country tune. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. It's um, it's something that you, I, I... Sorry? Do you use country tuning? Have you experimented with country tuning at all? <laughs> so so this, this is a, a funny uh, kind of point for me because I for the longest time because I, I came to harmonica from guitar and um, oh, yeah. Yeah. and i had never met a harmonica player and and this was kind of early days of youtube harmonica so i was watching adam gusso's videos and gleaning as much information as i could from him and mm. lurking on forums and all i wanted to do was play all the guitar lines that i would play on guitar on harmonica mm. And mm -hmm. the only way I could see to, how to do that was learning how to overblow and and, and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. n not necessarily playing sweet overblows, just being able to hit a note relatively in tune. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't until really, re like really recently, um, I, I did a, a, a an online uh, live stream with uh, Todd Parrott. And, right. you know, Todd is a... An, unbelievable overblow player and mm. he was talking about using country tuned harmonicas and i thought i was like well, wh why why do you why do you use a country tuned harmonica uh when you can overblow so so well he said well you know the the five overblow is never going to sound as sweet as mm. uh having that that major seventh on the draw notes just just mm. clean uh, mm -hmm. So I'll, if I'm playing melodically and I want to have that note as a sweet note, then I'll use a country-tuned harmonica. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
long story short, I've not played country tuned, but I've now been convinced that that that's something that I need to start uh, doing because yeah. because that bothers me as well that it's not a particularly pleasant sounding note even if you can hit it sure really well. it's a very small change but it it can it makes a big difference I mean obviously um, your flat seventh um, you can still get it but you can't get it um, it's not a natural note I mean your the, the, the original five draw you have to bend the five draw down to it mm -hmm. so um, some cording your cording will change if you're with tongue blocking it won't be won't be as good for blues or whatever but you will gain a lot of other other things from it um you know um and that yeah so yeah i recommend um it's a very it, you know it's probably the most minimal change you can make to a harp but it, it does make a, a big difference and it also opens up um flavors um you know that major seventh sort of sound but with all the um all the uh expression of cross harp um and not just cross up, it means your fifth position minor is really good as well. You know, fifth position. So there'll be E minor on a, on okay. a C hub. Yeah, yeah. And that becomes really nice because you've got, um, yeah, so I'd, I'd recommend it, um, giving it a go for sure. That's, uh, yeah, ne next on the on the to-do list. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, with, with that kind of idea in mind, have you noticed a lot of people getting in touch with you since uh, lockdown was announced uh, asking for... Uh, custom harmonicas and, and things like that because they've now got time to learn how to play in an alternative tuning? Um, well, uh, I just sell... Um, um, I've got sort of two strands with my little... Um, um, I suppose the business... business Harmonica business. One is um, where some more kind of, um, I suppose, way out things are made here um, on my little workshop at home with um, 3D printing and all that kind of thing. Um, and um, that's um, uh, that's now I've sort of stopped a lot of that because I was getting someone in to do those kind of things and they weren't you know couldn't they couldn't get them to come over. Um, but I've also got another strand where I get things made in China um, and there's I've got a, a, a business partner in Shanghai, a good friend of mine, um, uh, and he basically um, the, the harps are made at the factory mostly by East Top, some by Kongsheng. And then sent to him in Shanghai, and then he po the orders come into me, and he posts them out. So, in that sense, um, if people have been uh, wanting to try so-called custom harmonicas, they're essentially just custom tuned harmonicas okay. um, in power draw, power bender, um, and two or three other tunings. Then they can just bas basically buy them off the website. So that's been going fine. I mean, um, the sales have been similar to how they were before. Okay. Um, but I don't really have anything to do with it directly. Um, you know. I came up with the the tuning and the um, worked with the factory in the, in the initial stages to get the harps working well. And now basically the orders come in and they just get shipped out around the world. And I don't actually have any direct customer dealings about them. Um, so yeah, that's going been going pretty well. That's good. Um, as you say, people have got a lot more time to do all this um, over the long term. I wonder if they'll have the money because a lot of people are losing jobs and and all this kind of thing. So um, you know maybe. Um, those kind of things. It depends on how long it goes, but I think this, you know, people are going to probably have less money to spend on so-called luxury <laughs> items like um, harmonicas and things like that. But we'll see. Yeah, it's well, it's it's virtually impossible to predict, isn't it? It's uh, I, I noticed two two things happened uh, when when it was announced uh, on my site. My current students started doing a lot more practice. Uh, mm. which was brilliant um mm. and and there there was a secondly quite a big uptick in people joining um mm. but but then there's also been quite a lot of people contacting me saying i've lost my job and yeah. I've, I've got to. so it's so hard to tell what what's going to to happen long term yeah. yes um mm. but uh but yeah, let's let's have a little chat about uh, the power bender tuning because I'm absolutely fascinated by this. Uh, would you just talk us through it for for people who don't know, just a kind of like a, a, a quick version of the power bender? Mm. Okay, um, uh, maybe I'll um, I'll start with um, a related one called power draw. Um, so power draw is uh, it's got the same top end as power bender, but it's um, it's more similar to Richter for most of the harp. So I just um, so basically power draw is the same as a Richter up to hole number six. And it's got that flat five. And do all that kind of stuff. So up to hole six, it's totally standard. 
But then from hole uh, number seven upwards, um, you've got um, hole seven, like on a C harp. This is not a C harp, but imagine it were. Your seven draw is still a B. But, um, but in, instead of the, the B being next to a C note, which is above it, mm-hmm. um, you know, on a, on a standard Richter harp, seven, whole seven would be C blow um, and B draw, meaning you can't bend the, the B draw. On, my, on this one here, I've, got, I've taken that C, if you like, down to an A. So here's your B. And now your blow note, instead of being a blow C, is down to an A. So now you can bend the B. So that's the same as that's same as three draw down the bottom end. Okay, now your eight draw um, is um, the the C, um, which is was in um, in hole number number seven on a C harp, has moved up to hole number eight. So that's your C, mm-hmm. um, and now your um, your D, which is um, still in eight draw, has stayed there, but the D is above the C. That's the same as four draw. So you can bend that four draw. You can bend your eight draw the same. So now you've got bends on seven and eight draw, which are same as three and four draw in the bottom end. Mm-hmm. Now, and then in hole number nine, um, normally you've got a um, like a blow G and a, a draw F. Um, here it flips around. So the, the draw becomes a G, which is like two draw. And your um, blow is the same as in two draw as well. So you can get a full you can get a full bend. So you can get all your same um, draw bends in the top end of the harp as you were in the bottom end of the um, the blues harp. And then hole number ten, um, which was, was a C blow and an A draw, uh, it's now flipped around. So now it's an A blow and a C draw. <laughs> so the notes are still there, but they flipped around to blow, um, draw. So here's your C, and you can bend it. So you can. Um, so basically the whole thing is draw bends um, in the top octave instead mm-hmm. of blow bends. But your bottom part of the harp is the same. Okay. Now, power bender is um, a little bit more radical. This is actually, this is a C harp. <laughs> that was a, I think that was an A, was that an A harp? That was, yeah. Um, this is a C harp. Um, actually, maybe I should get an A. Yeah, I'll get another A just to um, compare them a bit more, a bit more directly. So, um, so that was an A harp. This is an A harp and power bender now. Now, power bender changes earlier in the in the in the tuning. So you want holes one, two, three, four are the same. <laughs> same so your Richter bottom end stays the same but on hole number five it changes so on power blow it stays the same on power power um, bender it's and now that's you can hear that's a different sound but basically your your what 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 was your five blow becomes a draw And what was your six blow and Richter and power draw? Uh, power, yeah, power draw, which was a blow note. Six blow becomes a draw note. So basically, you've got your home note in cross harp is a draw note in the middle octave and a draw note in the top octave. So basically, all your home notes in cross harp are draw notes, and um, which can be bent. Mm-hmm. So you can do um. So you can do a lot of the same kind of riffs and licks um, in the top octave and sort of in the middle octave as you can down low. So power bender is the one. It's a more radical change, but it's the one that I personally prefer. But normally, when um, if people are interested in this this kind of sound or whatever, normally I would say, well, maybe try power draw first, um, because then you can continue to use all your familiar 
meat and potatoes range, you know, holes one to six. And then all you have to do is um, just adjust to the high draw, high draw bends in the top octave. Power bender is more of a commitment. <laughs> you have to, um, uh, you know, abandon some of your mid, mid octave stuff and, and relearn that. But the advantage is that you can get more chromatic. For instance, you don't need overblows in the middle octave anymore. So you've got you got full blow, full bend, and then draw. Now your overblow on what was an overblow on hole four is now a draw bend on hole five. And then you've got your flat seventh. So you can play chromatically in the middle octave, super easy, just with draw bends. Um, and um, your, you know, your your overblow uh, that was on hole six is now a draw bend. So you've got that over, you know, you don't have to overblow there at all. Um, so. A lot of your overblows and um, overdraws are just become draw bends on on the power bender. So yeah. you know that's kind of the partly the rationale around it, and it means you can play in you know different keys um, a lot more easily. For instance, say something like say Sweet Georgia Brown. You can just, you know, that's in three different keys, mm -hmm. and it's really easy to do. There's no overblowing involved. Partly, it's, um, I'm, you know, a bit like you, as you say about the overblows. Um, they, you know, when you hear a really good overblower with a fabulously set up harp, they can sound great, and people are getting better and better at making them sound great. But it's been a long, long time, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, I've just never really liked the sound of them too much. Um, you know, I've always preferred. Uh, the sound of a bend better than a than an overblow. So I've um, basically configured harps to allow me to get the same notes that you get with overblowing, but you get them with um, with bends and normally draw bends. Yeah, because you also uh, do half valving, don't you? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was one of my ideas, really, that I came up with very early on, about uh -huh. 1980. And um, so all my harps are half valved, which means I can't actually overblow on them anyway because um, you know it stops you doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really use the vowels for bending so much. It's more for expression and flavor, you know, right. on the on the blow notes. Um, but you can bend on them. I mean, P.T. Gazelle um, uses uses them for to get extra notes. Personally, um, I mean, I if I have to play something more jazzy, I'd, I'd use a like a, a half valve chromatic. Um, like this is a this is a you know CX12. Mm -hmm. um, this is in another of my tunings, power chromatic. But this is half valved, and every note can bend. So you can play um, like a chromatic scale um, really, um, really easily. So normally on a chromatic, you'd have to go. Now I can get all of that with bends. So it's, it's, it's a chromatic, but you can hear, you know, I'm bending a lot on it. And then you just push the slider in. I've got this little hook thing there. I call it a slide hook. Uh -huh. And then you can just instantly get um, play in the you know other keys. So you can you know um, when you've got essentially you've got two harmonicas in the one, and yeah. they're both bendable draw um, you know draw bendable uh -huh. harps, and um, it gives you all the notes plus a lot of what I call um, bend in harmonics, for instance, um, you can get the same note two ways. So, you know, when you say you're for um, full draw, uh, well, not full draw, <laughs> this would be, um, well, here's a, just a, a draw note. But I can get the same note by pushing the slide in. And, um, you know, like a draw, um, like a... So you can get notes more than you know more than one way. Um, so personally, I think that you know the half valved chromatic is a really um, excellent um, way for people who want to play more complicated styles like jazz or whatever, uh, but still want the expression of um, you know of the blues harp, if you like. 
Yeah, um, definitely. I, I'm I'm intrigued because you you have so many different tunings and different setups uh, at your disposal. What what's the go anywhere do anything harmonica? Like, what, <laughs> what what do you go for first? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, basically, it's all very well having quite a few different tunings, but I'm I'm not so good at improvising in all of them. I mean, certain certain ones would be really um, almost specifically for a certain style. The ones I'd use um, just to pull out for a jam would be a, a, like a power bender diatonic or maybe a power chromatic, um, uh, you know, half valve chromatic for a more kind of jazzy tunes. Um, but yeah, power bender for more bluesy things. Um, but I also, Paddy Richter is another tuning I came up with and I use that for um, um, Irish tunes on the diatonic. And then I've got, you know, like this thing called the Asia Band, which is a really cool harp. Um, <laughs> So it's got really big bends. Um, it's all draw, no blow notes, and it's um, but it's got really big bends on all the draw notes. But again, that's one that I couldn't really improvise on too well. Mm. You know, um, I can um, I'd more learn a piece with a few variations and, and play it on that. But I I love playing it, but I haven't. Um, you know, it's so so different to all my other things. <laughs> I haven't really um, learned how to jam on it so easily. That's cool. Um, so. I, I've been talking to to a bunch of of great harmonica players uh, during this series, and, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm noticing a kind of a recurring theme. There there are two main camps. There are the, <laughs> the the players who kind of decide to play within the limitations of the instrument and and use that as a strength, mm. and then there are the players that uh, want to get loads more extra stuff that that no one thought was there um mm. and and you obviously fall into to the latter category um but I, i'm always intrigued why well, there's, probably, there's probably three camps if you think about it because there's probably the, you know maybe within that or you know within the first camp or maybe it's a subgroup but um there's probably the people who just love the the rick the harp as it is like mm. uh, many of the the blues players and they just want to play how the great classic and they don't really want to necessarily explore beyond that and then there's people like howard levy who has all the skills and the brain power to to do way more than um you know has was possible before on the richter harp but he's stuck with the richter harp he hasn't tried to alter the harmonica but he has found all these other ways to overblows and overdraws and other ways to get to find out stuff that no one knew was in there but it's still on the stock, stock format then i'm in a another group which is you know basically why stick with that format? Why not change the whole operating system? You know, yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's the camp that I'm in. <laughs> yeah, P potent potentially you're in a camp by yourself. <laughs> oh no, no, there's there's quite a few, but yeah, I suppose I'm a bit of an extreme case in that area. <laughs> so my 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 thing thing I'm intrigued about is is why you committed to doing it on harmonica when there might be other instruments which which would naturally be more flexible. Okay. Um, well, you know, the harmonica just took hold of me in terms of, um, you know, a love, a love for the instrument and the sound. So, um, you know, I wanted to express myself through the harmonica. I did play mandolin qu quite a lot for um, in my, you know, in New Zealand and composed quite a few tunes on mandolin and became quite good at it. But it just doesn't have the, the soul, I guess, of the harmonica. And um, so I've always... Um, I don't know why, but I've always just wanted, if I can't do something on the harps I've got, I'll try and change the harp to allow me to do it <laughs> rather than picking up another instrument on which you could probably play that stuff a lot easier. Hmm. No, I, I, yeah, I think the, the expression um, of, of the harmonica has got to be the, that, that it's, it's the biggest strength, uh, which we, we probably accept all the weaknesses for that, that, that mm. big strength. Um, yeah. So, I, I, I want to know because uh, we're we're kind of probably getting towards the the end of this. Um, mm. Is there anything new that you want to kind of share with with listeners? Anything you've been working on that you're excited about? Mm. Well, I mean, in the last few years, I was in some ways I wasn't doing much playing at all. I was just really interested in um, CAD design and um, uh, making um, you know. Um, these things, you know, using 3D printers and all that. But in this, yes, since really um, only the last few months, I've been, you know, getting back into playing again, which is great. And I suppose one of the things that um, I've got intrigued with is um, uh, pitch to MIDI conversion, you know, like um, mm -hmm. 
um, on my, I've got a little iPad there, and I've been um, exploring. There's an app on there called Mini Guitar 2, which is designed for guitarists, but it will actually track your harmonica signal as well. And um, so I've been spending quite a bit of time um, exploring synth sounds um, and blending them with the harmonica. And um, just, I suppose that's that's it's an area that I've been yeah putting quite a bit of um, you know being quite absorbed in in, in recent months. Um, it's not really anything to do with tunings. I mean, or types of harmonica. You can get the same things with any any kind of harmonica. It's more just basically expanding a whole new range of sounds that can be triggered um, with your harmonica as the interface, if you like. I mean, if you wind off, turn off the harmonica <laughs> and just have the synth sound, you don't, it doesn't sound like a harmonica at all. It can sound like anything, like an organ or a flute or whatever. Um, I mean, there's some issues. It's not perfect yet. I mean, the tracking can be tricky and you, you have to alter your playing style a little bit to, to make things work well. But it's a fascinating area. Um, and um, so that's what I've been spending quite a bit of time on recently. Very cool. And you've put together some uh, lessons on Vimeo, haven't you, that people can uh, download? Yeah, the, I mean, the, um, the the videos are on YouTube as well. But if they want to get into the nitty gritty, um, I've got a, started a little teaching website on Vimeo. It's pretty, it hasn't got many videos on it yet. But um, um, yeah, it's the, people can really, if they want to get into the details of it, the geeky ones, they can really go there. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'll include that in the show notes, and, and I've also included uh, everything else you've you've mentioned in terms of weird and wacky tunings and uh, and cool instruments. And and I really uh, uh, highly recommend that listeners go and uh, check out Brendan's website because uh, there's there's just so much stuff that you you start reading through it and and you think, yeah, this is this is what's been missing from my life. Life, I definitely need a double harmonica or you know, <laughs> a, a sliding reed plate. I, mean, I, I have lists and lists of things I want to quiz you about, so I might have to try and twist your arm to do a, a second episode at some point. Uh, yeah, but, I'd be glad to come on. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your time with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, catching up with you and uh, hope to catch you soon. Take it easy. Likewise, Tom. Yeah, really good to chat. All the best. Cheers. Brilliant. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Join me next Monday for the next episode. Happy harping! <laughs>